in the interest of time and um, to give our presenter his full due, we're going to go ahead and get started um, as people continue to, um, to join. So um, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this first webinar of our 2020 Fall Winter Science Seminar Series um, brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center also known as the CASC, Southeast CASC or SE CASC. So in this virtual seminar series, we'll be highlighting some CCASC funded projects that support resource management actions across the Southeast. Um, my name is Carrie Furness and I'm the program manager here at the Southeast CASC. So um, I'll let you know now what to expect from today's webinar. So um, we'll go over some meeting logistics um, and then introduce our speaker for the day who you likely know is Dr. Mike Osland. He'll present for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have um, some time for Q&A at the end and then give you a quick preview of um, the other presentations lined up in this series. So, um, so yeah, so now I'll pass the mic over to Ashlyn Shore, who's our communication specialist here at the CASC, and she'll give us a quick um, intro to our Zoom interface. Thanks, Carrie, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so as Carrie mentioned, I'd like to just quickly cover some of the features on our Zoom interface that we're going to be using during the webinar. Um, so as noted as on the slide right here, um, controls on the bottom left of your Zoom screen will allow you to connect to the audio using either your computer audio or via phone. Um, and that phone number is listed on the meeting link information you received, and we also have it listed just right here. Um, this is also where you can mute and unmute your audio. So we will keep all lines muted and ask that you also keep your video off so that we can just lessen the distractions during the presentation. In the middle bottom bar, you can access the chat window and I'd encourage you if questions come up during the presentation to submit those in the chat for discussion after the talk. We'll be monitoring questions there and we will pose them to our speaker during the Q&A session. A quick note for those who might be joining us only by phone, star six is the code to mute and unmute your phone. Uh, lastly, we will be recording the webinar and you can access that recording afterwards on the Southeast CAST website, uh, on our science series webpage and also on our YouTube channel. So pass it back to you, Carrie. Thanks, Ashlyn. Um, I'm sure we're all Zoom uh, experts by now. But, uh, <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> overview. So um, now we'd just like to launch a short poll um, just to sort of give us a bit of information about who's with us today, uh, and then also to help us know how to continue to get out information about these um, seminars. So launch the poll now. We'll just give you um, uh, about a minute to fill this out. Um, and so this will, this will help both our speaker know who's in the audience and maybe um, anticipate some of the information you might present um, in a different cast and also help us see who we've um, reached with this. So appreciate your taking the time to provide this feedback here. Looks like we've got about most people have voted so yeah, great. So let me give you another second and I'll end this poll and share out these results so everybody can see real quickly. So looks like university and federal agencies are running neck and neck here, um, but we've got some other um, community members, NGOs and state agencies and tribal nations online. So very great. All right, I'll stop this. And um, yeah, thank you again for, for providing that information for us. So it's great to see the breadth of people we have in our audience today. So now on to our presentation. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Michael Osland, who's a research ecologist at the USGS Wetland and Aquatic Research Center based in Lafayette, Louisiana. So Mike's research broadly examines the effects of global change on ecosystems and the implications for ecological conservation and restoration. Much of his research focuses on wetland ecosystems at the dynamic interface between land and ocean, such as mangrove forests and salt marshes. So he's gonna be talking uh, with us today about the results of some of his recent research um, on refining tipping points for range expansion of coastal mangroves and warming climate. So now take it away, Mike. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yeah, can hear you. Okay, okay. And 
Can you see my screen, Carrie? Not quite yet. I mean, I can see your screen, but yeah, let's get okay, your but not, presentation's okay. not. There we go. All right, all good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, th well, thanks so much for the invitation to present, and and thanks to those that that are um, that are here to listen. And so I'm going to be um, presenting about mangrove range expansion in the southeastern United States, and the title is "Refining Tipping Points for a Range Expansion of Mangrove Forests in a Warming Climate." And here's a outline for my talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna begin with some some background slides regarding um, mangroves and um, mangrove range expansion, but also climate change effects on, on ecosystems in general. And then I'm gonna focus on really two studies that have come out in the past year. One is focused on temperature thresholds for black mangrove damage, mortality, and recovery. And then the second study uses the information from that first study to evaluate temperature controls on mangrove distribution and structure in Louisiana. And then as, as Carrie mentioned, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions at the end of the, the presentation. So here's a, a real general um, figure focused on the redistribution of species, ecosystems, and biodiversity in response to climate change. It's from a paper in Science um, by Peckle and others in 2017. And it highlights all sorts of really interesting examples of how climate change is affecting species and ecosystems. And I included that red oval to indicate that, that mangrove range expansion is one of the, those redistributions that's, that's included in this paper. And um, that mangrove range expansion falls within this um, general concept that, that could be called tropicalization. Um, so in the Southeastern United States and also across North America, we have this dynamic transition zone between tropical and temperate ecosystems. And the northern range limit of many tropical species are controlled by freeze events. And so this figure includes some of those. Mangroves are just one example, but hopefully with this slide, I, I wanna convey that although my presentation really focuses on mangroves, there's a lot of species that respond to these extreme temperature events in a very similar fashion. And under warm and winters, there's the potential for those species to move northward and affect the temperate ecosystems um, beyond their current range limits. And so here's another figure from, this is from a, a manuscript that's in review with, with a, a, I think it's around 50 different co-authors across North America that work in this tropical temperate transition zone. And this is data from a, a specific station in Florida that illustrates the influence of these, these cold damage or mortality events. And so most of our winters in this tropical transition zone in North America are pretty mild. So if you look at that, that blue curve, that illustrates most of our winters. The blue is the number of years. So on the x-axis, we have the minimum annual temperature. So those are, that's the lowest temperature associated with a, a specific freeze event. And then the y-axis, we have the return interval, intervals in years and then the number of years. And then in that gray, that gray box illustrates a real general threshold zone. So if a temperature is to the left and inside of that gray box, there's potential for cold damage or mortality. And I like to show this figure just because it illustrates that these, these ecologically relevant freeze events that result in cold damage or mortality are, are very infrequent. They don't occur every year. They don't occur every five years. And this return interval shows that they may occur every 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So they don't occur frequently. And, um, and that's important because, um, well, they're difficult to study and, and it's difficult to identify those thresholds and assess the ecological impacts of these freeze events because we don't see them every single year. And so it's hard to prepare from a, from a science, a, sci uh, a scientist perspective. It's hard to plan for these events and, and find a, a robust way to study them. All right, so in response to climate change, specifically decreases in the frequency and intensity of these freeze events, there's the potential for northward range expansion as these climatic zones move north for the species that are able to disperse into these new areas. And so here's a figure that, that illustrates that in a real simple way. Um, this is, this, these figures illustrate the change in the northward position of climatic zones under three alternative future scenarios. So the top panel is the current 
climatic conditions. And then B is a plus two, C is a plus four, and D is a plus six. And if you look at the movement of those oranges and reds, you can see how they move north and where they move north. And so the mangrove transition is in the, it's roughly in that orange and yellow, you know, just in general, if you look at the orange and yellow along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast, and look at the change in that orange and yellow, you can see where mangroves would, would be expected to expand under these different scenarios. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about one particular um, ecological response to these freeze events, and that's the, the transition between mangrove forests and salt marsh. And so mangrove forests are sensitive to freeze events, um, which can result in mortality or physiological damage. And so because of that, their northern range limit is controlled by these freeze events. And beyond their northern range limit, coastal wetlands can be dominated by these graminoid dominated salt marshes. And so in the Southeast, we have this really interesting mangrove forest salt marsh um, transition zone where to the South, coastal wetlands are often dominated by mangrove forests. And to the North, coastal wetlands are often dominated by salt marsh. And so what I'm gonna be presenting here is really that the attempt to try to quantify the threshold that separates those two and the temperatures that distinguish between mangrove forest and, and salt marsh. And I'm gonna show a lot of photos of that transition in a second too. So in coastal wetlands, foundation plant species play a really important ecological role. Um, they serve as, as the species that create habitat, they modulate ecosystem processes, and they facilitate the development of entire ecological communities. Coastal wetlands are very stressful environments. And so they're environments that there are very few plants that can tolerate the physically stressful conditions that are present in coastal wetlands. And so the species that are there, the plants that are there play a very important function role and they, and they serve as foundation species. And these foundation species govern ecosystem properties and the supply of ecosystem services. So um, for those, I think most of the audience works in coastal wetlands, so they know this. But for those that don't work in coastal wetlands, um, economists frequently rank coastal wetlands among the most valuable ecosystems on the planet for these different ecosystem services that they provide, including coastal protection, carbon sequestration, very important fish and wildlife habitat, water quality improvement, um, trophic linkages to the coastal, to coastal ecosystems. They help provide seafood and provide many recreational opportunities. And so a big focus of my research program is um, on the climatic controls on these different foundation species. So where it's hot, dry, and hypersaline, we tend to get algal mats or succulent dominated salt marshes. And then the winter temperatures control the transition from graminoid to mangrove. And so in this presentation, I'm really gonna be talking about the transition between C and D. So for terrestrial ecosystems, um, we have this really nice, these nice relationships um, defined through decades and maybe even centuries of study regarding the impact of climatic drivers on the distribution of terrestrial ecosystems. And so one of my interests have been well, you know, in thinking about the effects of climate change, if we have a, a given wetland type in a, a given position now, how might that change if let's say it's drier and more hypersaline, or if we get warm in winters, could that salt marsh become a mangrove forest or could that mangrove forest become a salt flat? And so th this is a nice slide that summarizes the goal of, of, of my research. And this, in this talk, I'm really gonna be talking about the salt marsh and mangrove transition. Okay, so here's a global perspective regarding different transition zones. Um, and so there's different ovals in this map. The blue are aridity gradients, and we're not really gonna talk about that, but I want you to pay attention to the red ovals. Those are winter air temperature gradients where there's a transition between mangrove and marsh. And these occur in South America, and also, but also in, um, well, sorry, in South America, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand and then also in the US and then in China. And the role of extreme temperatures is most important in the Northern hemisphere because the temperatures from the Arctic can travel across those continents. So if you look at the continents above those red ovals, that cold air can travel across the continents to reach the tropical transition zone. 
And that's part of the reason why extreme events play a more important role in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere. You look at the Southern Hemisphere, you've got um, all that ocean that separates Antarct Antarctica from those continents. And so in those, in those range limits, mangrove range limits, it, the, the extreme freeze events aren't as extreme. And so they play a less important role. And so I just bring that up because North America is really unique. The tropical temperate transition zone in, in North America is um, quite different from these transition zones in other parts of the world in that our extreme events are very, very extreme and they can cause mass mortality for mangroves and all sorts of other organisms. All right, so before I jump in the data, into the data, I want to quickly show some photos. I like to do this just for those that aren't, aren't that haven't been to these wetlands. And so I'm going to begin in Florida, um, where it's, it's more tropical, freeze events do occur, but they play a less important role. Um, they're not quite as extreme. And so coastal wetlands are dominated by mangrove forests. And so here are some photos of mangroves. And then as you move north, here are some photos of Tampa Bay, Mangroves are still the dominant coastal wetland type in Tampa Bay. As you get to Cedar Key, Florida, and also Apalachicola Bay, um, Cedar Key has historically been considered the northern range limit of mangroves. Uh, but there are a lot of mangroves just to the north in Apalachicola Bay. And, and there's two different species there, which is really unique, both the red mangrove and the black mangrove. But near the, these transitions, this ecotone in Apalachicola Bay and also Cedar Key, you get this mixture of mangrove and salt marsh. So this is a photo from Cedar Key. You can see the very tall mangrove forest, um, I think eight to nine meters tall. And then there's these abrupt transitions to salt marsh. So you have this, this really cool mosaic of mangrove and marsh. And that's because freeze events still play a very important role there in um, controlling the expansion of mangroves into marsh. And they historically have resulted in these oscillations, these expansion and contraction cycles. So here's some photos of the mangroves in Cedar Key. Now, as you move north of that, those mangrove range limits, here's some photos from Graham Bay in Mississippi. There are no mangroves, so it's too cold. The freeze events are frequent enough in this area that they limit mangrove established. Mangroves may arrive um, due to propagule dispersal, but then they would be quickly killed in, in, in some freeze. And so the coastal wetlands there are dominated by these salt marsh grasses. This is Spartina alterniflora and Juncus romerianus. All right, so now I'm gonna go around the Gulf real quickly, um, just to show the, the role of the aridity, aridity gradient in Texas. Um, so this is, these are photos of Louisiana. Louisiana has a mixture of mangrove and marsh. So I'm gonna talk more about that at the end of the slot, end of the presentation. Here's an image of, of the effect of a freeze. This was a freeze in 2014 that resulted in damage to this black mangrove. As you move into Texas, there's an aridity gradient that, that, that complicates this story in that you have less rainfall, the wetlands are more hypersaline and so you have the two factors that control foundation plant species and coastal wetlands. On the one hand, aridity and salinity, which can produce um, conditions that are so hypersaline that they're inhospitable to plants. On the other hand, you have the freeze events too. So in, in Texas, as you move across that rainfall gradient from wet in North Texas to dry in South Texas, you begin to pick up succulent plants. So the salt marshes tend to be dominated by succulent plants in central Texas. You, you do have some mangroves too, um, across all of Texas actually. And te there's, te there's mangroves all the way up to the Texas-Louisiana border. They're just not as dominant as they are in Florida. So here are some photos of succulent dominated salt marshes. And then once you get to the Texas-Mexico border, it's so dry and salty that, um, in addition to the succulent dominated salt marshes, you can get areas that don't have plants. They're too salty for plants and are dominated by these algal mats. So this is the Laguna Madre system. It's a really unique estuary. Okay, so that was a quick photo tour. I like to do that just so people have a mental image of, of what I'm talking about. And so now I'm gonna jump into the first study. And, and this is a project that was funded by the, the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and it leveraged the work of this tremendous group of collaborators that are listed here, all the co-authors on this paper. Um, 
this was a, a really big group effort. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. So it's a paper that was published in Journal of Ecology um, in 2020, recently. And it, it's a coordinated regional effort that includes 16 co-authors, nine organizations, and 38 sites. And so they, I'm going to list their names real quick because I'm, I'm so grateful of their participation and collaboration in this. Ken Dutton, Anna Armitage, and I, I know that some of these people are on the call. I looked at the participants. Carolyn Weaver, Richard Day, Courtney Lee, Laura Feher, Juice Sebrian, Aaron Macy, Randall Hughes, Karen Cummins, Caitlin Snyder, David Kaplan, Amy Langson, and Gordon Anderson. And so all these people provided data in different ways to that contributed to the study, and it, it would not have been done without this large regional collaboration. Um, so, as we talked about, warm winters are expected to lead to mangrove range expansion at the expense of salt marshes, and this map uh, shows where that expansion is expected to occur. Um, this is an old figure that I often use in presentations, but the, the black signify where mangroves are present, and the arrows signify where mangroves are expected to move in response to warm and winters. But a, a key aspect of that, and, and um, a key piece of information that we need to know is the tipping point. And so this tipping point is where salt marshes are replaced by mangrove forests. And there's been a lot of research focused on this tipping point um, in the past decade. And there's a range of threshold values in the literature, which are fairly close. You know, in the literature, there's been all sorts of different approaches to quantify this threshold. And, and they all zero in on this range, this, the zone between negative 3.2 and negative 8.9 degrees Celsius. And so, you know, there's, a, there's some differences there, but they all zero in on this, this tight, fairly close um, area. And so the, there's different ways that this thresh, these thresholds have been quantified and focused on different physiological responses of mangroves. So mangroves um, can be damaged by freeze events, but then re-sprout from buds. And so there's a difference between minor damage versus mortality. And I'm gonna get at that more in a second. And so these, previously the thresholds were quantified using laboratory experiments or remotely sensed data. And you see the spread of, of both data types and response, physiological response variables here as well as the identified temperatures. And so um, this is where the, the range of negative 3.2 into negative 8.9 comes into play. And so the goal of this study, we wanted to leverage a specific freeze event that occurred in 2018 to refine those thresholds. So to refine the tipping point, and we were specifically interested in um, refining and dis differentiating the threshold for leaf damage, which is more of a, let's say, minor physiological effect because of the ability of black mangrove. And this is all focused on black mangrove, which is the most freeze tolerant species and the one that is typically found furthest north in across the Gulf of Mexico and also the Atlantic. So we wanted to differentiate between leaf damage um, versus mortality. So if, if it's a minor freeze event, Avicennia, the black mangrove, can actually re-sprout. Um, and so we wanted to, to quantify where we think that mortality would occur. And so we want to differentiate between mortality and leaf damage. And so, um, so this, uh, this collaboration all began with, with what's called the Mangrove Migration Network. And it's a regional collaborative network. And I should say, I'm so happy to be presenting on this because I've only presented this one other time and it was in a five minute lightning talk. And oh my gosh, it was so hard. So I'm, I'm glad to have a little extra time to, to explain this. So the aim of this regional collaborative network was to better quantify the effects of freeze events on mangroves near their northern range limit. And it was established in 2014, not with all of the collaborators that were on that previous map, but a large group of them along the northern range of mangrove distribution. And we started collecting plant and temperature measurements in the field in concert in anticipation of a future freeze event. And so we were fortunate. Well, I guess, I mean, we had to wait four years from 2014 to 2018 for a, a regionally relevant freeze event to occur. But in 2018, in January of 2018, there was a moderate freeze event that, that allowed us to conduct this study. And so the minimum temperatures range from zero to seven, deg seven degrees, negative seven degrees C across the region. 
they affected 60% of the 38 sites included in that paper. Many of the sites had leaf damage and some of the sites had mortality. So you can see how because of the range of these effects and the range of temperatures, we are able to test and refine the thresholds for damage versus mortality. And then there, there were some sites with no damage because the temperatures weren't cold enough. And so here's a map of those sites. Um, there's two different kinds of sites. One are sites, the squares are sites that are in that mangrove migration network. And then the circles are non-mangrove migration sites. And you can see the range of temperatures. And temperatures were coldest in Louisiana and Texas. That's where most of the damage and mortality occurred. So we had field-based vegetation data focused on leaf damage, mortality, and biomass recovery. And then we also used temperature data, a combination of field-based in-situ temperature data with temperature loggers that were installed at the mangrove migration network sites. And then also gridded daily temperature data that was produced by the PRISM climate group. So the PRISM data set, which is a, a national data set, this is gridded data, does a, a fairly good job of, of um, capturing these freeze events across land ocean temperature gradients in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's a, it's a, a, a very important data source for these types of analyses. And so, okay, so here are some of the results. So this, these are thresholds for leaf damage versus mortality, and then also biomass recovery. And so on the y-axis, we have temperature. This is the absolute minimum temperature associated with the, that freeze event at the different sites across the region. And so the temperatures range from zero to negative seven degrees C. And on the top, we have leaf damage. And the threshold was, a, I can't, my, it's a, it was around negative four. And then the threshold for mortality was around negative seven degrees C. And then we characterized the different recovery levels due to that re-sprouting. And so at negative four degrees C, there was 90% recovery, negative five, 78% recovery, negative six degrees C, 62% recovery, and negative seven degrees C, 45% recovery. And um, you know, even at negative seven, if you look at the mortality, that's where mortality began to occur. It, it's not at 100%. Um, and so to get 100% mortality, you'd need a freeze event that would be slightly colder. That's something to import to, that's important to convey. And then also the biomass recovery levels at negative seven degrees C are also fairly high, 45%, and would be much lower for a freeze event of say negative eight, negative nine, negative 10. And freeze events of that magnitude do occur in this area. So in the eighties, there were many freeze events that were around negative 10. Okay. So that's the first study. And so I'm, now I'm gonna show how that information can be used to provide information that's restoration relevant and, um, and can inform wetland management. So, but before I do that, I wanna, I wanna thank all these people again. Um, this is a very large coordinated regional effort and it was a lot of fun to work with these 16 co-authors. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful that they were so um, generous and collaborative. And, and I'm hoping that we can produce a lot more products from this mangrove migration network. All right, so the next study is, is a, a more recent study where we use those thresholds to evaluate the distribution and structure of mangroves in Louisiana. And um, this is from a recent paper that was published in Diversity and Distributions. Um, gosh, just a few months months ago. And my co-authors in this paper are Richard Day and Tommy Michaud. Um, Richard is still at the, the Wetland Aquatic Research Center here in Lafayette, Louisiana. And Tommy was here for most of his career and is now retired. And so um, this paper uh, utilizes a data set that Richard and Tommy developed um, regarding, they, they developed a data set of mangrove observation points that we used in this study. All right, so Louisiana. Louisiana has um, some of the most abundant coastal wetlands in the United States. I think most, most people on the call probably know that. And most of the wetlands in Louisiana are, uh, most of the tidal saline wetlands are marshes. So you have these different categories, the saline marsh, the brackish marsh, and the intermediate marsh. Now, mangroves are located in that saline marsh category. So the areas, they have the potential to be located in the areas that are in red, but it's important to note that they don't have their own category. 
historically they've been lumped into this tidal saline marsh category. Um, and so the goal of this, this paper was really to evaluate the drivers of the distribution of mangroves in Louisiana, um, and then also to evaluate their historical presence in Louisiana from literature and herbarium accounts, and then per, use these temperature thresholds from the previous study to show where the risk of mangrove damage is highest, which is information that can inform restoration efforts. So it can inform where mangroves should or should not be planted um, due to the risk of freeze damage. So the specific questions were, within the past 30 years, 1989 to 2018, what has been the frequency and spatial distribution of, the, of extreme freeze events with the potential to cause black mangrove mortality and or leaf damage in Louisiana? Second, where is um, Avicennia germinans, that's the black mangrove, located in Louisiana, and how is its distribution influenced by the spatial distribution of extreme freeze events? Third, what are the relationships between the frequency of these extreme freeze events and the abundance height and coverage of Avicennia germinans? And then lastly, and this is where the management restoration comes into play, how does the risk of of black mangrove freeze damage very spatially across coastal Louisiana. All right, so there, you know, I think a real common question for coastal wetland ecologists in Louisiana that have seen mangroves is how long have they been there? Um, what has been their distribution over the past century? Were they here before, you know, in the 1800s and 1700s? And so one of the benefits of, of um, the coronavirus teleworking is that I was able to dedicate a week or two to looking at all these historic documents to determine how long mangroves have been present. And what I found is that there's, there's literature accounts going back to the 17th century of mangroves in Louisiana. It's really, if you look at some of these dates, so on the, the column on the left, we have observation year and they're organized chronologically. And then the individuals, some of these are, uh, you know, some of the first natural historians to write about Louisiana and, and they include references to, to mangroves. So in the 1700s, and then you've got some really interesting reports from um, the 18 to 1900s. There's one video in the Library of Congress of Teddy Roosevelt with black mangroves in the background on a barrier island in Louisiana. So this is a table that's in that paper. Um, it, was, it was interesting to, to track down these observations. And so mangroves have been present in Louisiana for a long time, but they've expanded and contracted in response to these freeze events. And so here is that data set that Richard and Tommy collected. So they flew over the Louisiana coast to, I, and their goal is to identify everywhere black mangroves are present in Louisiana. And those are the points from their data set, those orange circles. And so they identified by plane all of those mangrove observation points in the Louisiana coast. Mangroves don't dominate that entire area. The, you know, the, the size of those symbols overlaps the saline. Marshes are dominant throughout most of those areas, but mangroves are present everywhere. There's orange circles. And so they're predominantly present on the southeast, that southeastern outer coast. And I'll explain why in a second. And then there are some observation points too in the Chenier Plain. So they're predominantly in the Deltaic Plain. But there are two, if you look closely, there's two orange circles in the Chenier Plain, but only those, those two areas. Um, okay, so we use those points, and I'm going to explain how we use them in a second. So this is a map of the temperature-based potential for Avicennia germinans mortality and leaf damage during freeze-specific events in Louisiana. So these are four different freeze events in 1989, 1996, 2010, and 2018. And I used those thresholds from the first study that I presented to differentiate between mortality, leaf damage, and no damage, and produce these maps to show that where, if Avicennia germinans was present, mortality, leaf damage, or no damage would occur. And what it illustrates is this land ocean temperature gradient. So cold temperatures come from the north, they're colder on the interior on the interior of Louisiana, and then they warm up as they hit the warmer Gulf of Mexico. So 
the Gulf of Mexico is warmer during these freeze events. And so there's these land ocean temperature gradients. And that's why mangroves are on barrier islands and on the outer coast of Louisiana. But also that's the case for the rest of the Gulf of Mexico too. So this, this spatial gradient occurs throughout Texas, throughout Florida, Northern Florida as well. And what you can see here is that the 1989 event was, was there was mass mortality. You can see the red that covers almost the entire coast. And, and the freeze events since then have been more mild in 1996, 2010, and 2018. So we used the 30 year record of those freeze events to quantify freeze frequency. And here's a map of freeze frequency across a 30 year, 20 year, and 10 year period, uh, moving top to bottom. And on the left, we have the number of potential mortality events. And on the right, it's the number of potential leaf damage events. And this corresponds really, really well with where mangrove, mangroves are present. So where there's fewer mortality events, fewer leaf damage events, um, there's a higher chance of having mangroves in coastal wetlands. And so this is a, a daily data set where we just we use it to, to quantify this, this frequency. And here's the relationship between that frequency. So on the y-axis here, we have the number of freeze events with the potential to cause mangrove mortality or leaf damage on the x-axis. And then, and then the data from Richard and Tommy's mangrove observation points. And so on the top, we have all the observation points. In the middle, we have just the tall category. So they also quantify height. And then on the bottom, the solid cover. So they also evaluated and ranked the cover too. And it just shows the really nice relationships between the, the frequency of these events um, and the number of observation points. You can see the R squares there of 0 0.77, 0 0.94, and 0 0.87. It's a very, very strong predictor of where mangroves are, but also how abundant they are and how tall they are. OK, so we use that information to produce these, these maps of that characterize the risk of mangrove freeze damage. And so there's three different colors in these maps, moderate, high, and very high. And um, they go from green to red. And then in the bottom panel, I restricted it to just the saline, brackish, and intermediate marshes. And um, this is important information because it, 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 you know, in Louisiana, there's a lot of interest in using mangroves during restoration. Um, first of all, coastal wetland restoration is a, a very important, um, it's very important in Louisiana due to the high amount of coastal land loss, due to the high rates of relative sea level rise. And so there's a, a huge amount of coastal wetland restoration efforts in Louisiana and foundation plant species play an important role during those efforts. And as mangroves have expanded since the 1980s, there's interest in, in, in leveraging that expansion and potentially using mangroves during coastal wetland restoration. Um, this map shows where mangrove restoration is possible, but also where it's likely to fail. For example, it, it, would be, um, it wouldn't be very wise to attempt to, to plant mangroves or restore mangroves in those areas that are in red, because there's a high potential for a freeze event that could come in and kill the mangroves. And if you have mortality, you have the potential for all sorts of negative effects too. So. So from a restoration perspective, um, this is a map that can inform those efforts. And it also can inform the, the management of coastal wetlands too. And, and for those that have worked in mangroves in Louisiana, it, it explains why mangroves are located where they are, predominantly in the barrier islands and also on the southeastern outer coast of, of the deltaic plain. The Chenier plain is colder. OK, so now I'm going to, I want to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, so why are these transitions important? Why is mangrove range expansion and why, are, why is the effort to quantify these thresholds important? Um, well, it's important because if we get a shift from mangrove forest to marsh in coastal wetlands in Texas, Louisiana, and North Florida, beyond the current range limit of mangroves, it, there could be some effects on some of these ecosystem services that coastal wetlands provide. So, Salt marshes and mangrove forests are both valuable ecosystems um, and they, they provide different services. Some of these services are very similar. So like for example, the below ground carbon sequestration in, there's, is, is somewhat similar in both those systems. Now, but in terms of above ground carbon biomass, 
mangrove expansion into marsh is going to result in above ground carbon storage and big changes in the above ground structure of these ecosystems, which could affect things like wave attenuation and, and wind resistance. Um, it would also affect fish and wildlife habitat. So it affect avian habitat, for example, and, and potentially um, fish nursery habitat as well. But there's a lot of interest in the effects on the biogeochemistry, which could affect water quality and then the trophic linkages to other coastal ecosystems. So from a management perspective, um, these transitions, which are driven by a warming climate, have the potential to affect many of these super valuable ecosystem goods and services that, that wetlands provide. And, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about mangroves, but but for those that don't work in coastal wetlands, I, I really want to highlight that mangroves are just one example of this larger process that's expected due to a uh, warming climate. So in response to warming winters, um, there, are, there are many tropical species whose northern range limit is controlled by freeze events. And this photo, you can look at these photos, they include sea turtles, manatee, snook, um, mosquitoes out in the, the Sonoran Desert. One interesting aspect of this review is I've been able to collaborate with people across the country in the Sonoran Desert. These freeze events control the saguaro cacti. So there's all these organisms across North America who are that are sensitive to freeze events and their northern range limit could expand into um, in response to warm in winters. And so mangroves are just one very visible example, but, but um, there's a lot of potential for, for tropicalization of these temperate ecosystems in response to decreases in the, in the um, frequency and intensity of these extreme events. And here, here's a map that can illustrate that. If you pay attention to the oranges and reds under these three alternative uh, warming scenarios of a plus two, a plus four, and a plus, plus six, you can see those reds and oranges moving north. And, and again, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but the, the current range limit of mangroves in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast is located somewhere in that yellow and orange there. And mangroves are able to disperse really long distances, especially if they're transported by hurricanes, which happens at this time of year. They can be transported very, very long distances by hurricanes and, and move into new areas. And so if you, move, if you look at the, where the yellow and the oranges are and the reds as well in the future, you can see that they're, they're much further north than their current location. And so there's a lot of potential for mangrove movement, but there's a lot of potential for the movement of, of many tropical species, other tropical species as well. So that's it for my presentation. And I think we have um, plenty of time for questions. And if, if anybody um, has any questions or, you know, or wants to follow up, feel free to send me an email. We can set up a time to chat. But I think we have 15 minutes within this, this webinar for questions as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike, um, for that really great presentation. I think lots of uh, food for discussion for sure. So um, we have, we're going to, um, as Mike mentioned, we have some time for questions now. Um, so if you want to ask a question, go ahead and pop it in the chat box. Um, and or if the crowd's ruly, we can, uh, you can raise your hand or um, let us know that you want to, and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. So um, I'll go ahead and ask a question that's in the chat box now that was um, posed in, during the first part of your presentation. And the question was, um, do PRISM data exist for non-CONUS US areas? Do you know the answer to that, Mike? Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, PRISM is, to my knowledge, it's, it's just the US. Yeah, and in fact, recently, we needed a data set for Mexico that would quantify that. And actually Adam Tarando, who's a research ecologist at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, helped me get the data for um, Mexico. So, so I see, Kristen, if yeah. you have any questions about that kind of data, Adam Tarando, who's with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, would be a great person to ask. And, and I do know that there is some work in the Southeast cast to sort of try to develop some precipitation gradient information, you know, some more resolved um, data for the US Caribbean. So he, Adam and Jared Bowden, I think are, are Bowden and our group are, are working on that as well. So yeah, great. 
Um, so another question that is in the chat, and I don't like if you want to pull up the chat, you're welcome to, to have a look too. But um, one of the questions by Renzo was, do any of these historical reports that you reviewed, which were actually fascinating to sort of see that that history, I'll, I'll have to say, um, mention Native peoples um, reports. And I'm, documentation may be sparse, but I'm curious if there was any. Definitely. Yeah, those reports from the 17th century did. And I can send you, I can, I can send you the specific ones, Arantazu. But yeah, they definitely did. Yeah, and they were really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I forget what the the first one, the first one in that list. I forget who uh, did, did for sure. So yeah, I'll I'll highlight which ones. And I was very lucky that um, here in in Louisiana, um, specifically in Acadiana, there's a historian who helped me. Um, it, identify some of those and some of those references were were actually in French um, so it, that was a really a fun and interesting part of this project and ironically because of COVID I had the time to do it better than sourdough taking up that <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. yeah well I don't know you can eat sourdough <laughs> um so here's another question um from Carrie um, Schaefer, is there any evidence that overall ecosystem health would impact these temperature thresholds? Um, for instance, if the system has been damaged by a hurricane, would the threshold for damage be lower? Yes, yes, yeah. So that so, you know, that my to be honest, my presentation of the the thresholds is very is very simplistic, but there's a lot of other interactions. So your question, you know, has to do with interactions with other factors that could affect ecosystem health. And so one that, that comes to mind is um, salinity. Yeah, for sure, if an, an ecosystem was affected by hypersaline conditions, it may be more sensitive to a freeze event or, or anything, you know, inundation, excessive inundation, uh, potentially even high rates of relative sea level rise. So yeah, any other factor that would, have, that would be a stressor to these ecosystems would have the potential to um, affect where that threshold may be. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Carrie. Yeah, that's a good question. And I have sort of maybe one that's a little bit related as well. Um, so my question it has to do on the backside of that. Um, so what are the factors that you know influence those biomass recoveries level um, levels predominantly, or is that been investigated? Is that well known? There, you know, it's been it's been. Um, that's it's mostly based on observational data. There have been a few studies carried, but there's a there's a lot of need. There's there's a big need for research regarding the recovery, and so it has to do with um, there's there's really interesting microclimatic factors and effects in these systems. So one example is the temperature gradient from above ground to the ground. There, mm -hmm. That's a, a huge gradient, and so the in terms of the recovery. It depends on how tall the plant is and whether it's buffered by the temperatures close to the soil. And then the other interesting observation that people have made is that the propagules that are sitting on the surface are often protected during those freeze events as well because they're sitting right on the warm soil. Mm. And, and so there's a lot of variation in the recovery, the response of, the, of these ecosystem, of these mangroves and the resilience following those freeze events. And it's controlled by many different factors, including the height of, of the mangrove forest itself and its effect on the microclimate. Mm -hmm. And then and then as Carrie pointed out, other factors as well that could be stressed in the system. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, and so given that mangroves are sensitive to temperature extremes, um, Eric is curious about the relationship between climate change and increased variability in minimum temperatures. So how well do you think your climate models accounted for that um, variability? So in the in the future, yeah. So so the the um, the scenarios that I presented in this study are just a plus two, a plus four, and a plus six. Now, and I've used, but I've actually used future projections in a in a different study, and there are others that have a, as well. Um, but yeah, the, it's very hard to predict those extreme events. And then, and also, it, it, you know, it depends on whether you're talking about in the next decade or two decades versus the end of the century. There's some big differences there as well. Um, and, and 
part of that in the near future has to do with these jet stream oscillations. And I'm not a climate scientist, but um, as we get these jet stream oscillations, which are connected to Arctic warming, um, you do get these these freeze events that it can extend further further southward. So, yeah, that's an excellent question, and um, and and it's there is a lot of variability in those minimum temperatures. But it, it really depends on whether you're you're uh, talking about you know whether we're going to get a freeze event in the next decade or two, or whether it's the end of the century. Mm -hmm. So. Um... Here's a question about the mangrove migration network. Is is that an active network, and are can other sites, you know, organizations join that network? Um, yeah, if anybody would like to join that network, they could just send me an email. Okay. And um, and it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty simple um, design. That it's not a complicated plot setup, or and the vegetation measurements are fairly straightforward. So. So yeah, if, if anybody in the audience is interested in joining that network, just let me know and we, and we can talk. Okay. And so are there any coordination in that network with um, colleagues in Mexico? No, so far, no. It, you know, when we set it up, we, we targeted, there were a couple of factors. We wanted to target the Northern range limit of mangroves. And so in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, freeze events don't play a very important role. And they, you know, they're further South and so there's not the dramatic damage or mortality that we see in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And so that's why we haven't included Mexico in that network. And, and we, we just wanted to include collaborators that we knew were located in areas where we expected there to be freeze damage and mortality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's in Texas, Louisiana, the Bear Islands of Mississippi, and then also in North Florida. Those are the areas that we targeted. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I'll just open it if there are other questions. I have another, but I don't want to dominate. But thanks for these questions that are coming in the chat box. There's, this is some good conversation, but I'll just um, pause for a minute and um, see if there are others who want to uh, pose a question either by unmuting yourself and, and asking it or by popping it in the chat window. Okay, then I'm going to jump in with my question. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess I was wondering um, if there, if if you or if you, if there is any attempt to sort of really try to measure some of those changes in specific ecosystem services with some of these changes. Oh yes, yeah, and that's and that's a huge effort, and and I'm I'm writing a review on that right now. Yes, that's there's there are scientists across the entire region. Mm -hmm. quantifying the effects of mangrove ex range expansion on different different ecosystem functions, ecosystem properties, and services. Carbon storage has been one of the primary um, foci. Mm -hmm. And so there's been groups in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida focused on the effects of mangrove range expansion on, on carbon storage. That's mm -hmm. been a key area. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the potential effects on coastal wetland responses to sea level rise. So in other words, if you have mangrove range expansion, will it affect the positive? So coastal wetlands have the, have the ability to adjust to sea level rise to a certain extent due to positive feedbacks between plant growth, inundation, and sedimentation. And so if range expansion affects those positive feedbacks, there's the potential for it to affect um, coastal wetland responses to sea level rise. So that's a huge question. And then um, the coastal protection question is also key in terms of wave attenuation and wind attenuation, and then and then of course the trophic impact. So, so Carrie, to answer your question, there's a lot of interest, and there are a lot of scientists in Texas, Louisiana, the Gulf Coast of Florida, Mississippi, the Bear Islands of Mississippi, and then also the Atlantic Coast of Florida, um, investigating the effects of mangrove range expansion on different goods and services. It's a, it's a very, very hot topic at the moment and an important one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, are there, is there any other questions? Anyone in the audience? Okay, 
Okay, then I'm going to ask a final question, and then I think we'll move on and let Ashlyn wrap us up here with um, our, our um, preview. So if, if you were um, a student considering where is the, the, the sweet spot to start to, to, to try to do some research in this broad area, um, what would you um, say to that student about where could they could make oh. the biggest difference in, in you this? Know, it's there's so much potential. Uh, it seems, this seems like, you know, in some ways it seems like such an obvious question and you think there'd be a lot of good work done, but, but that's not true. So I think it would depend on the student, Ashlyn, and what their expertise is in, you know, whether it's remotely sensed data or maybe they, they specialize in some trophic interaction, but there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions related to this topic. And so I know that's a, I, you know, I'm not really answering your question, but but I would say that there's a lot of, of potential in, in all sorts of aspects now. So, but one key one that comes to mind is so, and this is, it's, again, this is one of those really low hanging fruit is that this presentation has focused on um, the black mangrove, Avicennia germinans. Mm -hmm. um, there are two other common mangrove species in the Southeastern US, the United States, the red mangrove, Rhizophora mangle, and then the white mangrove, Lagunculari racemosa. So the same type of work that's been done here focused on Abyssinia um, needs to be done for those other two species. So I, I think that's especially important in, in its low hanging fruit. Um, I think there's a need to better characterize the historical expansion and contraction of mangroves near these key range limits in, in um, the Gulf of Mexico, so in Texas, and then also in in northern Florida, um, and then and then maybe even most importantly, this range expansion that um, has occurred since the last major freeze events in the 1980s, I could, needs to be better quantified both in, both in terms of the speed of the range expansion, the changes in in structure and function. Um, uh, there's just there's a lot that can be done. So I, I would say to that student that. There are, there's a lot of important questions that are really low hanging fruit related to this topic. Okay, great, great, thanks. Well, thanks again, Mike, for this really um, great presentation and, and um, discussion. So we will, if you wanna stop sharing, we'll let Ashlyn share out her uh, last slide just to sort of wrap up and um, I'll pop in here. Your, if you want to pop your email into the um, the chat, to the chat, just so folks could access, you know, do that, and I'll pop another couple of of uh, links in there as well. Okay. Thank you so much, and thanks for everybody that attended. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mike, for that presentation, and to everybody who posed the question. I think this has been a really interesting discussion. Uh, we are nearing the top of the hour. So just to wrap up today, um, I did just wanna preview the next webinar in our series. Uh, next month, we're gonna be hearing from Jacob LaFontaine, who's a research hydrologist in the North Cross Virginia office of the US Geological Survey South Atlantic Water Science Series, Water Science Center, excuse me. Um, and he's gonna be presenting on assessment of water availability and stream flow characteristics in the Southeastern US for current and future climatic and landscape conditions. So you can get more information and register for this webinar um, on our website. The link is ccasc.ncsu.edu backslash ccasc.science-series, uh, but we are going to be putting those links in the chat, uh, both to the overall web page where you can get more information about the presentation and more information about Jacob, um, and also just to the direct registration link. Uh, we also will be sending out an email reminder uh, through our newsletter list. So if you all aren't on that list and would like to join, feel free to just drop your email in the chat and I can make sure um, that you guys get added to that list. Um, but if we don't have any more questions, um, thanks everybody for joining us today. And thanks again, Mike, for that wonderful presentation. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks you all.